Good morning. Hey, we're going to jump right back into the Gospel of Mark this morning. And so if you got your Bible ready, hopefully you do, just pull it on out and let's go ahead and open to Mark chapter 1. We're making our way through the Gospel of Mark as we look at the life of Christ. Uh, it is so important for us to spend time with the Master this way, to, to, for all the things that we study in Scripture, and we should study all of it. Uh, we should definitely spend time going back to the person of Christ himself, the center of all of Scripture, the, 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 even as the author to Hebrews would say, in times past, God spoke through the prophets, but in these last days, he's spoken to us in his Son. And so we want to make sure that we look at him as we want to know about the nature, character, purposes, plans, all these different things in relation to God. Surely, even as he told his disciples, if we've seen him, we've seen the Father. If we know Christ, we know God. And so um, with that said, we open to Mark chapter 1. And uh, Jesus, to this point, has been healing. Uh, he has been casting demons out. He's been teaching with authority. And the people have been noticing these things. Well, another example of his authority, uh, of who he is as a person in a number of different dimensions now comes to the fore as we continue on looking at the next episode that comes up as Mark records it. And so in ch chapter 1, verse uh, 40, Mark records that now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying to him, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Not just you can heal me, but you can make me clean. Uh, then Jesus moved with compassion or feeling deep pity for this man, stretched out his hand and touched him, which is crazy to think. You would never touch a leper, especially in those days. And so the fact that he had such deep pity and compassion, it expressed itself through doing the unthinkable by touching this man who had been cast out of society because of his leprosy. And he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him. It's that word immediately in Mark's gospel. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. And he strictly warned him and sent him away at once and said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go your way and show yourself to the priest and offer your cleansing uh, for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded, at the very least referring to a passage we'll, we'll, we'll consider in Leviticus 14. Uh, those things commanded by Moses as a testimony to them. However, he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the matter so that Jesus could no longer openly, uh, could, could no longer openly enter the city, but was outside in deserted places, and they came to him from every direction. Uh, no doubt this miracle was another enormous um, um, thing for the people to witness, and they responded to this by uh, coming to him, or you know, they didn't witness it per se, but as they got testimony of the man who had been leprous being cleansed, uh, they, they again continued to crowd Jesus and bring their sick to him and such. Um, leprosy. Leprosy is a, uh, a really, really um, horrifying disease. Uh, it doesn't so much kill its, by itself, but what it does do is it, it kills the nerves. It, it numbs the body to feeling. Uh, and it is seen as humanly incurable. And so in that time, when, uh, and even up until, you know, through medieval times and such, um, when somebody had leprosy, they were cast out of the camp. They weren't allowed to live among others. Uh, there, hence, you've heard of leper colonies, places where people with leprosy, which is widely still not fully understood, um, uh, people had to be separated. And so... Uh, in some sense, leprosy was kind of a death sentence, but socially, for sure, uh, it was the kind of thing where your life was essentially over. You couldn't be with family. You couldn't be with friends. You couldn't be in the community. You couldn't go worship with others uh, and all of these things because <clears throat> nobody knew if it was communicable. Nobody knew how it spreads. No one knows how it happens to begin with. And so um, when, when, when this leper came to Jesus, he was completely violating protocol regarding how you were to handle yourself if you had leprosy. You would never just go up to somebody. But he was so desperate and he so trusted that Jesus could make him clean and heal him from this disease that he came to Jesus and begged. He gets down on his knees and he, he implores him, please, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus is deeply moved with compassion with this. Um, the, 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 the way this man just just with reckless abandon, just comes up to Jesus and begs, please, I know you can do this. 
Um, it's interesting when you see various examples of people just kind of throwing caution to the wind because they just need to get near Jesus. Uh, a woman with an issue of blood, again, unclean, she comes up and touches his garment and Jesus uh, responds favorably to her for this. Uh, the, the four guys who lower, uh, presumably their friend, they would lower this, this man down who's paralyzed on a, uh, a cot, a stretcher essentially. They lower him down, tearing open the roof of the house that Jesus is in and lowers him down in his midst. And Jesus uh, forgives his sins and ultimately clean, uh, heals him as well. Um, there's, there's something to be said about just letting nothing stand in the way of getting to Jesus. And so this, uh, this leprous man comes up to him and Jesus very simply just says, I'm willing, you're cleansed. And the man was healed. And Jesus tells him not to tell anybody about it, but go to the priests and let them know what God has done. And so um, leprosy is something that uh, 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 is not only a horrifying disease, it's a hopeless disease. And uh, that being said, God made provision for the cleansing of leprosy in the Old Testament. And um, uh, probably most clearly in the passage Leviticus 14. Now, chances are, if you have been uh, participating in a read through the Bible in a year uh, program, like in the back of your Bible, it probably has a way to read through your Bible in, in a year. And that's a good idea to get the whole word of God into you. Um, but if, you, if you've taken on that, um, that daily challenge to do that, chances are that when you got to Leviticus, uh, it's, it's kind of struck you as being kind of the dry spot on the water slide if you read through the Bible in a year program. Leviticus seems to be a really hard to understand book. It's something that's difficult to get our minds around because so much of it has to do with ritual in, uh, in the Jewish faith. And so when we read it, we don't understand like, well, all these really odd sounding prescriptions to do in various circumstances. But let me suggest to you that there are a couple of places in Leviticus in particular uh, all of it's important, but it's important to understand it for the context in which it's given. But there are some wonderful, wonderful insights into the character and nature of God as you look through this book. And so it's important for us to consider um, um, passages like the one we'll, 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 we'll sort of quickly look at here in connection with what just happened in the Gospel of Mark. <clears throat> Leviticus 14 is, is one of those places where God describes uh, or it's the place in primary where God describes what is required uh, if somebody is cleansed of leprosy. Again, a hopeless disease, but God makes provision in, in anticipation of healing and cleansing from uh, leprosy. And so the instructions are there. Now, when you read through the instructions, again, like so much of the book of Leviticus, especially to a Gentile, I'm a Gentile, I didn't grow up going you know, in as uh, ethnically Jewish. I never went to Hebrew school, any of those kinds of things. So, you know, a first reading of this passage seems really odd. What in the world is going on with this? For example, let me read some of it here. For time's sake, I'll invite you to read the whole passage yourself, but let me just read some of it uh, as we begin to look at it for a moment. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Leviticus 14, saying, this shall be the law of the leper for the, uh, for the day of his cleansing, and he shall be brought to the priest, and the priest shall go out of the camp, and the priest shall examine him, and indeed if the leprosy is healed in the leper, then the priest shall command uh, to take for him who is to be cleansed two living and clean birds, cedar wood, scarlet, and hyssop. And the priest shall command that one of the birds be killed in an earthen vessel over running water. As for the living bird, he shall take it, the cedar wood and the scarlet and the hyssop, and dip them in the living bird, uh, and the living bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over the running water, and he shall sprinkle it seven times on him who is to be cleansed from leprosy, and shall pronounce him clean, and shall let the living bird loose in an open field. And uh, he who is to be cleansed shall wash his clothes, shave off all his hair, and wash himself in the water that he may be clean. After that, he shall come into the camp and shall stay outside his tent seven days. And it goes on. Now, Again, this sounds odd to us in many ways, and it goes on and it even continues to sound kind of strange, uh, you know, until you begin to unpack uh, something here that I'd like to speak to. Um, in Leviticus 14, again, this is the prescription for those who have been cleansed of leprosy, okay? Now, again, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a disease that no one expects to be healed or cleansed from. But again, the idea here is not just that they're healed, they are healed, 
But there is this connection with being cleansed. In other words, ceremonially made clean so that they can once again uh, enter into society and worship and be part of the camp of Israel. Um, to leave the leper colony, as it were, and to go back into society, which would have been a breathtaking, uh, incredible moment for somebody with leprosy, somebody who'd lost all of that to be given entrance back in, the relief and release that would be experienced in such a moment. Um, well, God gives prescription on how this is to be handled. Why is there all of this instruction? And again, so much more that we didn't even get into. Well, there is uh, an important thing for us to remember when we think of the scriptures. Jesus in John chapter five, when talking to the Pharisees, uh, told them, these students of the law, he said, you study the scriptures because it is in them that you think you have eternal life, but it is they that speak of me. And Jesus makes the claim here that the Old Testament scriptures point to him, they speak of him. Paul would make a similar uh, statement in Galatians 3 when he talked about how the Old Testament uh, was essentially like a schoolmaster or a teacher to sort of keep people walking, in particular the Hebrews who would study it, but really in order to keep people walking within a certain lane so that when Jesus came, they would recognize him. They essentially would have been walking in the direction that would point them to him. And so when Jesus says the scriptures speak of him, that's very literally true. And interestingly, in Leviticus 14, that's one of those examples where this is true. For example, and I'm just gonna kind of skim through and point out a few things here and invite you to read the passage on your own and consider the parallels that are being drawn here in the Old Testament of the, of the work of Christ. For example, in verse two again, there is this need of a priest to declare someone clean. A person can't just declare themselves clean. They have to be declared clean by the priest. Okay, a priest's job was to represent the people to God and God to the people. Well, our ultimate high priest, Jesus, is the one who ultimately comes out of the camp, as it were, and, and, and inspects us and ultimately declares us clean if we have, in fact, been made clean. And as we go on, we'll see that it's he that makes us clean. Uh, verse three, the priest shall go out of the camp again to go and declare uh, uh, to the one who has uh, been made clean from leprosy. In verse four, two birds are taken. Uh, uh, one is ultimately killed and uh, the live one is dipped in the blood of that bird that had died. This may speak of the dual nature of Christ, both in his humanity having died for our sins, but in terms of his deity, uh, obviously not able to die as God. You know, he is both the God man. And that shed blood ultimately is how he, in his humanity, pays for our sins. But yet it is in his divinity that he is free from the sin uh, that would ultimately have kept him down. It was our sin, or uh, he ultimately uh, paid the debt of others. And so we have these two birds. Uh, and the second bird that's alive, after it's dipped in the blood, is eventually set free. Uh, much like the resurrection or something like that, may be in view there. Uh, some of these things are, albeit somewhat subjective as we connect the dots here a little bit, but if we understand that Christ can be seen in the Old Testament, then in some of these ways, we recognize parallels that are being drawn. Now remember as we do this, by the way, before we go any further, that when you look at, uh, when, you, when you use metaphor or allegory, at some point, they always break down. And so it's not that we're getting the full picture in each of these examples, but there is some hint of something in there. But we want to be careful we don't draw some analogies or metaphors too far because then we can ultimately start getting into some trouble theologically. But to recognize a parallel or a shadow of something to come, uh, matter of fact, Paul would use that expression in Colossians when he talks about um, people not holding you to holy days and Sabbaths and new moons and festivals and such, which are a shadow of things to come, but the reality is Christ. Well, this is one such ritual that presents sort of a shadow of a reality that is yet forthcoming. Uh, verses seven and eight in Leviticus 14, the blood is sprinkled on the one, the person who is to be cleansed. Again, the idea that um, we are ultimately made clean by the shed blood ultimately of the lamb, which also comes into view here in Leviticus 14 soon. But, um, but the idea that without the shedding of blood, as it says in the Old Testament, was reiterated in the book of Hebrews, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. And so there is this sprinkling of blood upon the one who is cleansed. Why? Because it represents the idea of being cleansed. 
Uh, that blood is symbolic of this. Uh, and also he is then to, uh, or she, but he's uh, to shave their head and to wash themselves uh, as if starting over. All the things that reminded of before, the dirt and filth on the body, the, uh, the shaved head, just there is a fresh start and it's, you're new. Paul would refer to this idea and when writing to the Corinthians, right? Uh, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. All things pass away. Behold, all things become new. Well, if you're in Christ, it means you have been set free from your sin. You've been washed clean of that hopeless condition that you were in, ultimately through his own shed blood. And then this idea of shaving the head and washing, we don't do this today, obviously, when we're born again. Um, but um, but in, in terms of the leprosy, that was a, a physical outworking uh, that, that represented that, that, that cleansing that took place. Um, after this, the priest would take two lambs and one of them would become a sin offering. Again, we clearly understand the parallel of the lamb as a sin offering, the lamb of God. This goes back to uh, ultimately uh, in, uh, in the Exodus when they're, when they're released, the blood of the lamb on the doorposts, the shed blood of the lamb ultimately spoke of their deliverance. Well, here a sin offering is given in the form of a lamb as well. Um, we'll come back to that again in a moment too. Um, the blood from that lamb was then put into, uh, I'm using my selfie cam for this, so I'm not sure if it's coming backwards or not, but left hand, uh, the priest would take some of the blood, put it in the left hand, would take their finger, and they'd put it on the right ear, uh, the right thumb, and the right big toe of the one who was cleansed. And then they would take oil, and they would put it, again, in their left hand, with their right hand, they would go ahead and put it on the right ear, the right thumb, the right big toe, and you would have this person now who had been covered by the blood and had also been anointed with oil. Um, oil, oftentimes in the scripture, becomes uh, something that is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so it, do we see a parallel here between one who has been made clean and the blood represents that to now also being uh, anointed with the Holy Spirit? We may see that parallel there again. Um, uh, I think there's some clarity to that personally. Again, some of this is somewhat subjective. We have to recognize that. But at the same time, if we do see the, the work of Christ and the person of Christ spoken of in the Old Testament, these are hints at such things. Um, verses 21 through 32. This is where I want to bring up the lamb again. In verses 31 and 30, uh, verses 30, uh, 21 to 32, we see that not only can a lamb be used as a sin offering, but if you were somebody of a lower socioeconomic status where you couldn't afford a lamb, other animals, uh, two degrees deep actually, were prescribed for those at varying lower economic classes. In other words, this was not just reserved for those who could afford it. Anybody who God had cleansed of leprosy, could go through this process and be reintroduced or welcomed into fellowship once again. Uh, similarly, in Leviticus 1, and I think also in Leviticus 6, we see a similar prescription in regard to worship. There is a certain offering that is to be presented by those uh, who are wealthy. There's another one for those who are middle class. There's other offerings for those who are poor. Uh, if you're wealthy, you can't offer the ones that the poor people offer because you can do better than that. You can ultimately present your, your best is better than simply just the thing that is nothing. Um, similarly here, uh, I should finish that thought in Leviticus, meaning that if you were poor but you couldn't afford uh, one of the animals that the rich people could afford, your worship would still be considered meaningful to God. This is the best you can do, and God accepts that. Here in Leviticus, if you are cleansed of leprosy, it's not just uh, if you're wealthy that you can afford to now come back into fellowship through the offerings that are prescribed, but even the poorest of the poor can come and, and ultimately re-enter fellowship in that. In other words, God made a way for everybody. Didn't matter where you came from, what your status was, God made a way for you to come back in. And that's an important thing because the ground is level at the foot of the cross. When people come to be saved, it doesn't matter where they're from, what's, what status they have in society, there is a place for them and God makes a way for them. Uh, uh, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him, right? This doesn't depend on your uh, capacity or your wealth or your status or standing. There's room for all. 
And then verses 33 to 57 in Leviticus 14 go on to speak about the cleansing of a household of a leper after the cleansing has happened. Well, at the end of this, Jesus tells uh, him after cleansing him to not tell anyone, but go to the priest. Uh, Now, first off, go to the priest first because they're the ones who therefore have to declare you clean. Uh, Now, interestingly, in Jesus' time, Jesus having performed this miracle, he he sends the man to the priests and they are going to recognize that this man has been cleansed and they're going to declare him clean, but they also, in connection with that, have to acknowledge the miracle that Jesus did. And this is another thing that begins to, on the one hand, infuriate them and separate them as they, re- as they resist him, but it becomes a means by which people, uh, other people begin to put their faith in him. But there is uh, uh, this, this incurable, hopeless condition is ultimately changed by the person of Christ. Well, if you're out there, by the way, watching this, uh, my hope is that as a Bible study for those who know Jesus, this is a meaningful thing that causes us to to maybe scour the Old Testament to find those places that speak of Jesus. That's an exciting exercise and you should do that. But my hope is also for those maybe who don't know the Lord to recognize that while some of these things seem odd or confusing, you've never heard them before, Leviticus, wow, that's a strange book for me to read or anything like that. My biggest hope for you is that you would take away from this the knowledge that Jesus ultimately came into the world to pay for your sins, that he is ultimately the one who can take you from your hopeless condition and ultimately make you a new creation, to, 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 to pay for all of your sin and your debt, to wipe away the old things and to make you literally new from the inside out. Does that mean you'll never sin again? No, I wish that were so. But At the same time, the sins that you've committed have been paid for, the sins you will commit. Jesus died for those on the cross. And by putting your faith and trust in him, no longer are you going to sit in judgment for those things. But you're free now because of the blood of the lamb, because Jesus shed his blood for you. He paid your debt for you, just like he paid mine. Not only that, but the Holy Spirit comes to live within us. He ultimately helps us and guides us and leads us. He helps us to remember the things that Jesus said. He helps us to live a kind of life that we didn't have the power to live prior to being saved. And ultimately, he is the seal, as Paul would write in Ephesians. He's the seal of our guarantee, the fact that that God will, in fact, bring home that which he now possesses in us. And so we just want to just give you that opportunity to recognize these things, but not only recognize, but respond. And so as I often do, I'm going to give an opportunity as I close in prayer, as I pray us out of our time this morning, for you to receive Jesus yourself, to be covered by the blood of the Lamb, uh, to have your sins, to, to come to finally embrace the idea of God's grace, knowing and acknowledging that Jesus has taken your sin upon himself and has paid for them. It's done. It's finished. All that's left now is for you to receive. So that said, let me pray and give you that invitation. Father, we thank you so much for your grace. We thank you that you've painted a picture of your son uh, throughout the pages of the Old Testament. This is just one of, uh, of an almost countless number of places where we can see the person of Christ being further brought to the fore in the pages of the Old Testament. And now that he's come, we see that you have spoken through him to us, that we would come to know your desire to draw us to yourself, that we might have peace with you, and that we might ultimately be your children. And so, Father, for those uh, out there who are listening or watching and uh, they've never made that personal commitment, they've never put their trust in Jesus, they've never put their faith in Jesus who died for their sins, I want to give that opportunity now for them to come. And so, Father, I pray you draw them by your Holy Spirit to this moment and to this confession. So if that's you, I invite you to pray. Heavenly Father, I'm a sinner. I don't take it lightly, but I also don't Avoid acknowledging it. It's what I am. And like the leper, I'm hopeless apart from the miracle of your work in me. And so I today want to put my trust, my faith in Jesus, believing that he paid for my sins once and for all and trusting that that was sufficient to make me clean. And so I do that now. I pray that you'd fill me with your Holy Spirit. As you draw me to yourself as one of your children, Help me walk with you, to follow in your ways, to read your word and to know you better and to hand my life over to you more and more fully every day. 
I thank you, Lord, for loving me, for sending your son to die for my sins. I thank you that you rose again the third day. And now I can look forward with anticipation to life beyond the grave, standing before you, forgiven and free. And Father, I just pray that until that day, that you would help me to walk with you and to bless you with my life, even as you have blessed me through your son giving his for mine. I thank you, Lord, and I praise you and I bless you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. As always, I invite you to reach out and let me know uh, that if you've, if you've entered into the family of God today, if you've prayed that and received Jesus yourself, there's, uh, that's just the, the beginning. The, the, the conversion of a person to Christ is something that happens in just a moment. But now there's the daily walking with him that we learn as we grow every day. So I would love for, uh, for you just to reach out. Uh, make sure you have a Bible. I can make sure you get one if you don't have one already. Uh, I want to help you find a good local church that teaches the Bible somewhere near you so that you can be part of a fellowship of believers and you can all grow in your faith together uh, and just help you take those first steps as you begin to learn, just like I did, just like any other believer did. I was fortunate to have people share the gospel with me just like I did with you. I was helpful. It was great to have friends around me that helped me learn to walk with Jesus. And now it's been nearly three decades. And I, I've just been so thankful for that helpful first start in helping me grow. So I wanted to just offer that to you as well. So uh, reach out by the comments uh, down below, either here on uh, YouTube or Facebook. You can email me through our church website at calvarychapelfranklin.com or my own personal blog at parsonspad.com. And I would be glad to interact with you on that, just talk to you and help you begin to walk with the Lord. And of course, you can also comment and ask questions. Some of you do already, and I'm always thankful to hear from you. So God bless you. Thank you for uh, listening today. And we're looking forward to catching up again next time. By the way, if you're watching this on a Friday, we just do the podcast Monday through Fridays. Saturdays are great days for me to finish studying for Sunday. And then, of course, we have our Sunday live stream, which we invite you to watch as well on our website at calvarychapelfranklin.com. So uh, we'll catch up with you after the weekend and uh, looking forward to going back into the Word with you. So God bless you.